Connectivity, it's an integral and defining aspect of the future of transportation and perhaps all walks of life. But what is it? And what good does it do? It's the overall concept of a world where everything from infrastructure to transport to society in general is digitally and seamlessly connected. How we use connectivity is only limited by our imagination. Connectivity is very much a sum of its parts. We make the world of transportation safer and more efficient. And welcome everyone to Volvo Group Live, a series of live events um, where you get a chance to tap into the knowledge of Volvo Group experts on topics that matter. And today's topic is about AI and data science. So kind of buzzwords, we want to make that concrete for you today. So we will do a live demo on how we would solve a real uh, Volvo problem with data science. Uh, but before we get into that, I would like to invite you to uh, tag friends who might be interested in today's episode and uh, really invite you to stay on until the end of the event for um, we will actually uh, offer you a challenge, uh, a business problem to crack for you to, uh, to be able to enter a VIP lounge in a couple of weeks. How to unleash the value of data. This is what we are going to find out today with Nils, Robert, and Helen. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Robert. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. Actually, this morning, you told me uh, about a great news. You've made it to the list of the Nordic top 100. Uh, alors, what is it? Of data, advanced analytics, and AI practitioners. So people who are strongly dedicated to, to supporting the data community and accelerating the data and AI innovation capabilities in the Nordic region. So well done for this achievement, Robert. Uh, do you think that every problem can be solved with AI? Thank you, Selena. Well, it's an interesting question. And I would say you need to choose the right method for the right problem, considering the value at stake and also if the problem is interesting enough. You don't need to use a space shuttle to go and buy uh, grocery stores, do you? Uh, I mean, you need to balance AI first with value first. And in our context, value is about providing sustainable transport solutions. Sustainable is the key word here. The Volvo Group is a house of brands, 12 brands that offer trucks, buses, construction equipment, engines, etc. Uh, Robert, how do we use AI in our line of business? Well, AI can help us develop both new and enhanced products and services. It can help us for business disruption and also in the internal efficiency. And uh, can you give us a, a couple of concrete examples here? Of course. Uh, for example, in product development, we just launched this new Volvo FH truck. That's a good example where we can really utilize AI. It mm -hmm. can be used in R&D in general, root cause analysis, in component prediction, and also to enhance features like autonomous solutions. So that's about products. Anything else? Of course. I mean, it's like uh, rings on an onion. You can go for driver operator to support them and coach them. You can go for the transport route optimization, fill rate, uh, electrification, but also for the, so to say, operation in general to go from product to processes. And we have some examples, for example, in uh, where we have uh, supported the loading and removal of excavation uh, rubble. There we can really address the full control over production in real time. I, I, I guess, Robert, that data is the core ingredient to your magic or to your craft. Uh, what kind of data do you get to work on? Well, data is a real asset, and we really would like to work with the relevant data. Our baseline is, of course, connectivity data that we retrieve from the more than 1 million connected customer assets. But then we can also utilize other internal data sources, external data sources that make sense to the problem to solve. Does it take only data to be uh, good with AI? How about other capabilities? That's also a very important part of this equation. We need to have the right methods, tools, and competences. Competences that we see now 
Nils and Helene. Nils, great to see your Mandalorian t-shirt and uh, uh, that they represent. So we'll get to chat with them in a minute, but for now, I would like us to uh, dive straight into a, a business problem. I'd like to introduce you to Jonas, uh, who is our Vice President for Electromobility at Volvo Trucks, Volvo Trucks being one uh, entity of the Volvo Group, obviously. Most welcome, Jonas. Um, so you collaborate with Robert and his team. Thank you very much. Uh, how are they helping you in your job? Well, um, thank you for having me here. To, to uh, as as my job is being responsible for setting out the long-term uh, strategies, product strategies for Volvo trucks, in terms of electromobility, it's also my task to make the roadmaps for how we can uh, achieve our our goals to be sell 100% fossil free vehicles in 2040 in order to be completely CO2 neutral in 10 years later in 2050 uh, so there here we then uh, today already have started the journey we are uh, pioneering the market basically having our first electrical offer out on the market in 2019 and as as robert said we have launched uh, uh, a couple of more vehicles, electric offerings. So we basically have the widest offering on the mar market at the moment. It's a small market, but it's growing. And we have set a quite an ambitious target towards uh, 2030, where 50% of our truck sales in Europe should be electric. And with this ambition target then, uh, we can benefit significantly from a, a data-driven approach. Mm -hmm. Because in order for us to be able to optimize the, the best possible electromobility total offer, uh, we need to really understand our customers' behaviors. I mean, the devil is in the details and also here. So what uh, operational patterns do they have today? Uh, how do they conduct their missions? Uh, what are their driving patterns? Uh, how daily driving distances, how much do these daily driving distances fluctuate over time, the stopping be behavior, loading, unloading, uh, where do they stop overnight? In order, by knowing that, we can optimize our offering and, and set the right strategies when it comes to charging, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we can do this on a big scale, uh, European scale, basically, but we can also uh, turn to our customers or customers that turn to us, help them and assess their current business, of course, with data to see how they can electrify their op current operations in the best possible way. So uh, w what kind of questions would you actually submit to Robert and his team of data experts? Well, uh, a typical uh, question could be, or a couple of questions could be, let's imagine a typical uh, uh, Volvo customer, we can call them Fright X, uh, and they have a very ambitious uh, uh, sustainability plan on how they want to provide the sustainable transport food to their customers. Uh, and they want to start now, they don't want to wait until they can turn the whole fleet into electrical trucks, for instance. They want to start now, so they want to know, can they electrify uh, parts of their fleets already today? And then, of course, there are a couple of questions. Uh, what, what part would that be? How can they do it? Uh, what would uh, the necessary investments be? Uh, what, what can they earn? What are the earnings? Are there new opportunities, for instance, with, with overnight or nighttime deliveries and things like that? Uh, so the so typical question could, in that example, be uh, what, what would these customers need to do, for instance, to, to electrify, let's say, uh, a couple of percent of their fleet, let's say 10 trucks? How would you do that in the best possible way? So can Freight X electrify 10 trucks? That is the $1 million question. Yeah. Uh, Nils, you are our data scientist and you have 25 minutes to crack it. Uh, over to you for your magic. Thanks for having me. So we've received this business question then from, from Jonas and uh, by, by extension Freight X. And I will uh, start by saying that I will show some uh, analysis and uh, I will only show a small part of it live, but at least you can get a feel for uh, the workflow and, uh, and some of the things that you can do in the very initial phase of uh, data exploration, let's say. 
So we need to ask ourselves, how do we translate this business question into data science questions that we can perform analysis to, to figure out? So in a very simplified sense, as Jonas mentioned, the uh, electrification of a truck is mainly about two parts. So first, it's the energy that you can carry on board, the battery size. And secondly, uh, it's your ability to charge that battery. Do you only charge at night? Or can you fit in opportunity charging during the day? Or uh, even at the depots where you load and unload? And how much power is available at these locations? So from the truck's perspective, this, this question can be boiled down into two questions. What is the energy need? And when and where can they charge? So we've boiled down the question a bit. And in order to answer these questions, we need to look at the truck data. So we need to figure out how much energy they need to, to perform their operations and when, uh, when they, where they move, essentially what their routes are and when they stop. And since uh, the transport industry works with extremely tight margins, we don't want to have unnecessary downtime. So we, if we can avoid it, we don't want to have them stop to charge just for the sake of charging. We want to have them ch charge when they are standing still either way. So actual metrics that we will need to extract are then the fuel consumption, which will give us uh, the energy need, and the routes that they traffic, and the stop locations and stop durations will give us an indication of uh, where they can charge and for how long. And of course, we need to take into account the charging infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, do they only ch charge during the night or are there other locations where they can charge? And as a reminder, keep in mind that Freight X is a fictitious customer uh, of Volvo trucks and uh, what you're about to see is not real data. And, uh, but either way, uh, Volvo Group takes the privacy of our customers very seriously. And for each analysis, we of course only use the data in accordance with the agreements that we have with our customers. But now we're getting somewhere. So we've boiled down this business question into um, uh, some, some real tangible questions. So let's dig into to the data. So we're gonna work in Python and uh, start up a fresh notebook here. And uh, I'm just going to do some uh, some coding here. And uh, first off, we need uh, uh, we need to have um, a package. So we need to import pandas, uh, which is a package that we typically use uh, for data science. It's very good at uh, wrangling data, essentially. So it's very very popular. So let's let's just start off. So we uh, we read in the data. And it's in freight X raw sample CSV. So let's have a look at it. Uh, so we have some data here and we have a vehicle ID telling us which vehicle it's about. And we have a timestamp for the data point when it was sent. We also have a position in uh, latitude and the longitude. And we have uh, an altitude if we wanted to use that. And here we come to two very important parts. It's the odometer, which tells us uh, how far the vehicle has traveled during its lifetime in kilometers. So it's accumulated here. And the same goes for the fuel use. In this case, it's, it's in centiliters. So how much fuel has the vehicle used during its lifetime? And then we also have some, some other things here that we won't use today, but can be interesting in other um, uh, situations, so what the type of event it is and some temperature measurements of varying quality. And uh, we also have some, some weights here that we won't, won't use. But looking at this data in this form is, is all well and good to, to look at it in a list, but um, that's not very useful. So the first thing that we can do is to, to try to plot it in a map. So let's import another package uh, called Folium, which we typically use. Um, and let's get a map going. Uh, map. And have a look at that. So yes, now we have a map of the world. And uh, we can zoom in to, to our region of interest for Freytex and uh, for us, which is Göteborg here in Sweden. And uh, for those of you who are aware, these map tiles are the uh, uh, OpenStreetMap map tiles, which are 
very good and um, they are quite colorful also so if you want to plot things on top of them it might be hard to see so i actually prefer to use uh, another uh, another one this one so let's update it yes so we still have the world but now it's a bit more neutral so uh, we can see things that we plot on top of it quite easily okay so uh, let's try to plot the, the points uh, that we have. And uh, as far as I'm aware, we can't plot it uh, in um, all at the same time, so we need to loop through them. Uh, so for each point then, we have a circle marker. And then we need to give the position here. So here we give the latitude. And then we also need the longitude for this. Let's have these points be uh, a bit larger. And uh, for each point, we also need to add it to our map. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, it's because of this one here, of course. Yeah, so we need to rename that. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, rename. Uh, so we need to remove this one here, essentially. So we rename this column to simply latitude, let's say. And we also rename this column to longitude then. Uh, longitude. And now it should work, I think, if we do this. But we also need to tell it that it's the columns that we name and we do it in place. So we do it in, in this row. Okay, that worked. So let's have a look. Yes, so it's the same data, but we have these new column names here. So these things can happen. And we try now. Yes, that worked. So we'll have a look at the map again. Ah, now we have some points in the Gothenburg region. So now already we see some things that we didn't see from the from the raw data. If we're not very familiar with the coordinates, we see that the these uh, this data sample the, it's it's typically around Gothenburg that that they traffic and they have some routes uh, along the the roads here. Uh, so now we know approximately where they move. But we also were interested in where they stop. And for that, we can do another analysis. So we need to import something here. Uh, so this is something that we wrote, uh, get trips and stops, it's called. And I won't go into detail on exactly what this does uh, due to time. But I can only mention in broad strokes that it basically this this method it looks at the time of the event and it looks at the the um, the duration of the event and it looks at the um, sort of the uh, how far the truck has moved so the odometer to see if it's standing still or not and um, so it basically groups this this data this raw data into trips and stops. Uh, get trips and stops and then we need to give it the raw and the um, we also need to give it a, another parameter called the minimum stop time and uh, to understand this we we need to tell tell it what what the minimum stop time we're interested in is so for instance if we put one minute here uh, then that would include probably stops at traffic lights very short stops but in this context, we're not very interested in that. So I think 30 minutes should do. And that should be a reasonable time for it to be able to plug in a charger or so. So let's run this. So now it's aggregating raw data into trips and stops. And something else happened that you see here that uh, we cleaned some of the data. And this is something that we almost always have to do. Um, and it could be of different reasons. For instance, if we were to use these temperatures, then we have to deal with these missing values in some way. Uh, but another thing that's relevant for this is that 
we can look at the the, di the difference in time between two events and the difference in distance to figure out an average speed. So figure out if the if the truck is standing still or not, and if that average speed is above, let's say, 120 kilometers an hour or something, that's completely unreasonable for a truck of this size. Then uh, we we need to clean that as well. So uh, some of these things can happen, and in this case, it was some uh, some some cleaning. Okay, so let's have a look at the stops then. Now we have a new data set, which is aggregated basically from, from the old one, uh, from the raw one. And it's um, the time is a bit more uh, different between them. And we still have a position of where the stop is taking place and how long the stop is in minutes. And you see here that they are all longer than this 30 minutes that we set. And we also have a, a delta fuel and a delta distance during the stop. so they that are not moving, but they might consume fuel. And that's uh, from idling, for instance, of the engine. So this, this can be very useful. Uh, but we also talked about um, the home base of the, um, of the vehicles. So where, and I mean, for this, for this fictitious customer, uh, for instance, we could just talk to them and figure out what their operations are by talking to them. But on a larger scale, we might be, uh, be helped to, to look at the data in this way. But to figure out the home, way, home base, where that is, we could do some filtering among these stops. So uh, night stops, for instance. Um, could be where the where the trucks stop during the night, and that's probably uh, on the uh, in the home base. So let's um, do a filtering here. It's where the stops delta time, so the duration of the stop is larger than let's say seven hours. It's unreasonable to think that the the trucks would stand still for that long during the day. Uh, so these are probably the night stops, and we can of course double check that by looking at the timestamp. But this should capture most of it, I think. So let's have a look at those quickly. Uh, and it seems that they are obviously longer since we filtered for that. And uh, they seem to take place closer to the evening. So, so these might be the, the uh, night stops then. So let's see if we can plot this on our map. Let's do that. So we do the same thing, but for the stops, uh, latitude, longitude. And then we also add a color here. Let's have them be black. And we do simultaneously the same thing for the night stops then. Night stops, and let's have those be orange. So let's see if this works. And look at the map again. Ah, now we have some more points, some black and some orange as well. So we're starting to see some, some patterns emerge here that uh, they stop some time, uh, sometimes along these, these roads, but mostly their stops seem to be concentrated in, in the towns around. And the uh, night stops, the orange stops, they seem to be concentrated somewhere here in Northern Gothenburg. So this is probably their home base then. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, yeah, it is for this fictitious customer, the home base. So now we're, we're, we're getting somewhere. We have identified uh, where they stop and where they stop during the night. So uh, with that, I think I will conclude this, this, this demo and we can go further, of course, but, uh, but this gives you a, an, an overview of what you can do pretty quickly by just, just plotting up the data. So I will go back here. And so we've gone from, from raw data to tangible information. And uh, we did that on the different colors here, but uh, we have plot the raw data on a map and we have identified where they stop and we have identified where their home base is. But we can go one step further here by looking at further at the stops because we talked about these important locations, these depots. And for that, we can do a, a density-based clustering of the stops. And I won't, we won't go into detail about that, but essentially we, um, we assume a, a reasonable density of the stops during the time period to figure out if it's a, an important location or not. And uh, if we do that for this, then it turns out that it looks like this. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Western Swedish geography, you, you get a lesson in that here as well. So we have the home base here 
in Gothenburg, obviously an important location, and Kungälv, which is a bit north, and then Stenungsund, Kungsbacka, south of Gothenburg, and as far away as Jönköping here in, um, in the east. Uh, so these turned out to be uh, important locations. So to summarize this, then data in its raw form might not be very useful to just stare at, but enriching it with a map and an aggregation into trips and stops and distinguishing between what's a day stop and a night stop gives also information that's important for the charging uh, strategy. And uh, we also did a density-based clustering of the stops to figure out these important locations uh, or depots, uh, presumably, that they, they traffic to often. And uh, this adds a lot of value. So can we already now say something about the uh, electrification potential of these 10 vehicles in the Gothenburg region? So we have found the home base, we have found some depots, we have found uh, routes essentially, and stops. So we can group the vehicles in, in a graph like this, uh, which is instructive. And on the x-axis here, we have the average daily distance driven. So how far do they drive during each day, which is important. And we also have on the y-axis something we call the geographic extent of activity, which is a fancy way of saying how far away from the home base you travel uh, during each day. And these, uh, as Jonas mentioned, the spread is also important. And these, uh, these bars show the spread over the time period of, because uh, not every mission is the same, not every day is the same. So that's also important to keep tabs on. And if we couple this to, to our routes, then it turns out that these trucks that drive not very far and keep quite close to Gothenburg uh, are the ones that traffic Gothenburg, Kungälv, Kungsbacka, which are the, the closest depots to Gothenburg. And one step up, we, we add Stenungsund to this, so they drive a bit farther and a bit farther away. And then this vehicle here is the one that traffics Gothenburg, Jönköping, uh, which is the farthest average distance driven and the farthest away from the home base each day. So uh, already here we can we can see something. We can divide these into two groups, uh, let's say. And uh, these these vehicles here, they don't drive very far and they keep quite close to the home base. So these turn out to be very suitable for electrification, while these might require some extra steps. But uh, in summary, I mean, with only night charging, so we charge when we're standing still during the night, and with existing operations given to us by, by this, we can reach 50% electrification of these vehicles because uh, we have five, five dots here and five dots here. So half of them, we could, this is good news, we could uh, electrify them already today without uh, doing much. But on the other hand, these vehicles, we need to take the next step and I, I, I won't um, um, go into the details here also, but essentially it's about um, doing something more. We convert the fuel uh, that they uh, consume into electric energy. So we pretend that they live in an electric world and we assume a battery size or a range of battery sizes uh, that are reasonable. And then we simulate. So we follow each truck along each day and uh, figure out when and where it can charge when it's standing still and uh, figure out whether or not it's successful with its missions um, in this electric world. Then. So if we do that, as an example, we can follow one of these trucks during one day. And uh, here on the x-axis, you have time. So we start at 8 in the morning and then we end our operations at around 4 p.m. this day. And this blue curve here shows the distance driven uh, during the day. So it starts off at zero for the day, and then it drives, and then it stops its day at 4 p.m. at around 250 kilometers driven. And this yellow or orange curve here shows the state of charge, that is the, the amount of energy left in the battery. So we start the morning uh, fully charged, and then we drive our way through the day, and then, unfortunately, this day, slightly before 4 p.m., uh, we ran out of, of energy in the battery. So this 
this day was not successful for this truck then. We can also look at the, the uh, patches here in the background, which signify the, the stops that the truck do does during the day. And the color of them is, uh, signifies what type it is. So a blue one is the stop at the home base, which is in Gothenburg for this fleet. And the green shows a stop at one of these regular locations that we identified as important. And the gray one shows uh, stops somewhere else. So where we can hardly expect there to be a uh, charging infrastructure present. So if we look at the, the same day, but a different truck, it might look like this. Um, so we have uh, stops again and uh, um, the same type of graph, but this one manages managed a bit better. So it ended its day at around 25% charge. So this one was successful with its transport mission. And we can notice something else here that the the state of charge goes up at a couple of um, couple of locations here uh, at the home base and at one of these regular depots. That's because we have allowed charging there. So we have uh, said said to the model that there is charging infrastructure at these locations. So we could charge the battery if we stop there. Now something else that we might notice here is that both these trucks during this particular day they returned to their home base during lunch. So around 12, they returned to the home base. And on the surface, these are identical trucks. So we noticed something that we could do here with the operations, at least on the surface. If we switch the afternoon mission between these trucks, this bit more challenging mission could be transferred to this truck, which had a bit more available charge at lunch. So. Um, we, of course, have to double check that with the actual operations if, uh, if it's possible. I mean, on the surface, they are identical trucks, so it should be possible, but they don't want to unload and offload unnecessarily. So uh, we need to anchor that, of course. Uh, but on the surface, it seems like we can shift these transport missions to make both of these trucks succeed. Okay, so uh, to summarize this then, uh, if we do this for each truck in, in the data set, and it turns out that if we add charging opportunities to, to this eastern uh, depot in Jönköping and this northern one in Stenungsund, and of course, uh, night charging during the night in, in the home base in Gothenburg, uh, we can shift these transport missions around in such a way that we reach 100% electrification for these vehicles. So over time, Freight X will uh, will turn a profit on this. They will save on fuel costs uh, because electric energy is, is cheaper and will be uh, increasingly cheaper than diesel. And needless to say, the environment will, will also profit. Uh, thank you very much, Nils. We've listened to your demo uh, with a lot of attention and we got uh, lots of questions, by the way. Um, how would you summarize your finding to Jonas? Uh, yes, so uh, the business question was, can Freight X electrify these 10 vehicles? And as we've seen, the answer is, yes, they can. And uh, we can do this in, in two steps. Uh, so 50% of the Freight X truck fleet, five trucks, we can electrify directly with existing operations and night charging. But we can go one step further, and we need to, to cooperate with them, of course, but some changes in the transport missions and adding chargers to a couple of their important depots, we can reach 100% electrification for this fleet of 10 vehicles. So, Jonas, you will lie us back to our customer, Freitex. Are you satisfied with this uh, answer or these uh, uh, well, findings? Yes, definitely. It's really exciting. Fantastic news. Uh, and it's uh, great that we can be able to support our customer in this case. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's, it's really interesting to, to see that we can work with combining different type of charging strategies. And also, I'm also very, what I like about the approach is that, that uh, Niels here, 
uh, understands the complexity of the questions and understands the, the business really and uh, also dares to challenge us a little bit and come up with with uh, proactive solutions here for instance like swapping the afternoon uh, task and so forth really really interesting of course and uh, uh, and then on top of that the way it's being presented uh, with little illustrations to make it for us that not working data sets as much we understand uh, the solutions so much in a very good way and it's very commun communicative so uh, fantastic news um and and of course <laughs> in that perspective i i'm 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 getting excited and i'm i'm wondering if we've been a little bit too conservative here even uh we try to to look at the part of of the operations but a natural question that pops up in my mind is of course uh, should we be more aggressive can we actually uh can we electrify a larger part or even the complete fleet of of Frytex of of more than 100 vehicles for instance that that is a really interesting question now i would say what do you say about that nils uh, yeah, so so for that, that's a, a more complex question, of course. I mean, this was a, a pretty small uh, data set and uh, quite localized around a specific area. Uh, but Freytex's entire fleet uh, of a lot of trucks uh, in, in the entire Sweden and maybe beyond, uh, for that, we need to look into the future, of course, a bit and, uh, and uh, maybe take into account feature improvement on the vehicles and, uh, of course, a more... Um, uh, a good approach on, on the charging infrastructure. So here we can benefit um, from a, a, a solution using machine learning. And uh, that's, uh, um, that's something that we would like your support with. And um, the, first, the first part of, of creating such a machine learning uh, uh, model is to create the baseline. And here's where we would like your support uh, in the audience. And that's, uh, here's where the challenge comes in. And in the comments feed, you can now find a link to the challenge uh, in which we want you to uh, look at a part of this fictitious FreightX data set and uh, figure something out that can help to form the baseline for this uh, more advanced solution. So we are very much looking forward to receiving your many applications. Uh, we have, I mean, the challenge is open for a week. Uh, check out the link for more details. Thank you very much, Nils and Jonas. Uh, you're back with us in a, in a few minutes for the live Q&A. But for now, I would like to explore the career opportunities with Robert. I mean, the, the open jobs we, uh, we have in the Volvo Group around the data area. Uh, Robert, uh, what kind of roles do you have in your team? Well, we have uh, basically three roles in our team. It's a business translator, it's data scientist, like we have a good, very good example here uh, by Nils, and we have data engineer. So if we just look at data engineer, that's, uh, you could say, a skill set to really make sure that we have data available. Also to handle questions like GDPR compliance. Being a data scientist, that's a lot of different and important dimensions like mastering math, statistics, programming, database handling, domain knowledge, soft skills, but also, as Jonas mentioned, a lot with communication visualization. And the third role, uh, the uh, business translator, that's like the bridge between business and data science, a role that can help to articulate both the known question, but also the unknown question. And as Jonas say, also reflect to drive to be proactive. And in those roles, are we actually taking on new competencies, Robert? We are. And we have a very good uh, uh, AI network at uh, Volvo where we have discussed those questions and we can see that there is a broad interest now to expand in advanced analytics roles across the group. So we're talking about expanding within data science data engineering, business translate, translation, but also data analysts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we actually got uh, very many questions in the chat about open positions. So uh, I think right now we're going to post in the chat uh, the direct link to our website, volvogroup.com slash career, where all our open positions are actually uh, available and posted for, for you guys to check out if there could be a good match. Um, but for now, I mean, what kind of experience can 
can you, can those talents expect uh, when joining the Volvo Group? This is a question I'd like to raise to Helen, uh, who has very recently um, entered uh, a new mission, a new assignment as a data scientist. Welcome, Helen. Thank you. Um, what do you actually get to apply your skills on these days? Uh, I get to work on a wide spectrum of assignments uh, from solving and supporting quality issues to future designs. For instance, for the our trucks tomorrow, the configuration of the fuel cells systems. Uh, right now, I'm working on a quality case for customer trucks, which are used in uh, mines in Philippines and Russia. Uh, they are used in very rough conditions. So for some of these vehicles, the front axle is uh, broken. So with the available data as we have talked about here with Nils uh, and the tools we have as well, I can support the project in uh, finding um, the root causes of uh, the failures. And the great thing here is that uh, we can do it without traveling to the sites. And that's great now with the pandemic situation and also for the future to re work remotely in a global context. Uh, I'm assuming that you're working on, uh, I mean, those projects you're describing are pretty large projects, right? How, how is the work organized? Are you working on your own? What is your scope? Uh, no, definitely not. I don't work on my own. Uh, in the project, we work in a team with, as we have different competences. But in my own team, uh, we also share our knowledge together as we have different uh, competences in uh, stats, in computer science, in uh, product knowledge, uh, experience. And uh, together we create a great team, a, a high performing team, I can say. And all my colleagues, they are so willing to share their knowledge with me. So it helps us extremely. Uh, what makes a great data scientist, would you say, Helen? What's your top five criteria? Uh, for me, it's to have a critical uh, thinking at looking at the problem to be solved. Uh, further, it's very good to have good technical skills, for example, in math, stats, and so on. Uh, you need also to be a good storyteller because here you need to communicate with multiple, multiple stakeholders, and it's very important, that part. Furthermore, you need to have experience, so you have an understanding on what you need to expect. And, uh, and lastly, it's always good to have a network. Um, you've been in your assignment for about nine months, so you're still a newbie in your profession. Uh, yeah. What strikes you most? I'm still uh, fascinated about the amount of data which is available within the Volvo Group and what you can do it. I mean, my colleagues have showed me the conclusions you can draw from the data, behaviors you can predict. It's fascinating. So I think I'm learning something new every day. Um, you're not actually new to the Volvo Group. You've been uh, with us for a number of years. What keeps you motivated to this day, you know, when you come to, well, not necessarily to the office, but when you come to, to your PC every morning? Uh, I'm, I mean, I've been for the Volvo Group for a long time and, uh, and the Volvo Group is a group of different companies. So that given me the opportunity to work with the different brands in the R&D world, with manufacturing, purchasing, aftermarket. And I've learned a lot uh, during all these years. It's a very good experience to bring in in data science. Besides that, it's always been a very good company for me as I have a family. Uh, it's uh, given my a good work balance between family time and work. And uh, as been part-time, for instance, during my career, and it's never stopped my progression. So I think it's a very good company. Uh, good that you touch upon that topic, Helen, because we know that in our industry, we've not yet reached a, you know, a gender balance, 50-50 uh, men and women. Uh, how, how does it work for you? How do you experience that? It's never made a difference to me because uh, people don't judge me for my gender. They 
I am judged for my competence. And well, that's good to hear. Good mm. to hear. Anything else that keeps your energy going? Uh, I like to run. I've been joining the running group at Volvo for yeah more more than twenty years. So I think it's a very good uh, benefit we have, and we have a lot of health coaches which arrange activities to yeah, keep your health uh, and have a good work balance. Uh, furthermore, uh, I've always been surrounded by great colleagues. Uh, today, I have colleagues in Sweden, in France, in Brazil, in US, and they all all very competent. And uh, during all my years, they always been very willing to share the knowledge. And, uh, and the yeah, it gives me energy. And finally, I have a great manager today. Uh, he gives me a lot of trust mm -hmm. and that I feel gives me energy, confidence and freedom in my development. Great to hear all the ingredients for you to, to make a, a great start in your new profession, Helen. Um, I have one final question. Our industry is uh, undergoing massive transformation. Uh, electromobility, connectivity, automation. Uh, we know that the demand for transport in the future will keep increasing, but it needs to be uh, done in a way that the, that can be sustainable for the planet. How do you reflect upon that? I like that uh, Volvo has a clear vision and wants to contribute to be at the forefront for sustainable transport solutions. And I feel I can uh, contribute in my work with data to create business value for the Volvo Group so they can accelerate their journey to more sustainable transport solutions. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Thank you. Good luck. Um, stay with us here. Uh, we have time now for questions. I would like to call uh, to call back uh, Niels, Robert and, and Jonas. Uh, thank you very much to our audience for your questions from all around the world. I will take um, a few of them, a few extracts. And perhaps the first one is for you, Niels. You were uh, coding or you were doing the demo in Python. Uh, are you actually um, using a specific package or other languages? How, what language do we work on or work with? Uh, it, it varies from case to case, but but uh, the common denominator for many of us and most of us in the team is that we use Python, and it's it's very suitable. And in particular, Jupyter Notebook environment that I that I showed is is very suitable for for data science because it's it's swift and you can do things uh, live. So so a lot of work is being done in in uh, in uh, Python. And for, for the machine learning parts, we use what everyone else uses, basically scikit-learn. And if we if that's not enough, we use uh, other machine learning packages, of course. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, Pandas, as I mentioned, is, is great. Good. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you showed rather few data points, Niels. Uh, but in general, this type of problem looks like uh, a candidate for k-means or similar clustering, right? <laughs> Yes, and uh, uh, so th this was, uh, as mentioned, very few data points. And uh, another thing is that the plotting on the map uh, that sort of was also uh, built on it being quite few data points. Because if if it escalates in 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 size, then that's pretty hard to point pinpoint these individual points. But yes, uh, k-means is a good example of, of clustering there. What we used here was another method called DB scan that is uh, density-based instead, because k-means it, it um, requires you to know exactly how many important locations you want to, to have as an input, but while uh, DB scan or the density-based one is, is uh, sort of unsupervised in that way that it uh, um, it's, it gives you the, the number of important locations back. The, the only thing you need to tell it is the, the, the density that it's important for you. Uh, is, uh, I mean, in our example, Freitex was charging uh, for the entire Sweden in Sweden. Will machine learning with data set uh, be required? Um, that depends. I mean, uh, for this, yes, uh, I would say that we could benefit from that. And uh, moreover, we can make a solution that can benefit other fleets. Um, that uh, we can reuse the same thing. We don't have to invent the wheel twice. So then we can have a, a model in place that can solve a more general type of problem in, in the electrification uh, 
uh, world. But you could do very similar things on a very large scale, uh, as I did. Uh, that's that you you might not need machine learning for a lot of these things. But uh, in order to take into account this uh, uh, public charging locations, etc., then uh, you could benefit from that. Yes. Thank you, Nils. Uh, I have another question that I would like to uh, put to you, Robert, perhaps. Uh, we often talk about um, how uh, we use data to create customer value, but mm -hmm. how can we use the same capabilities uh, to create internal value or internal efficiency, perhaps? It's a very good question. And you could say, if you have like routine task, you have manual task, AI can really support to make them automated. Uh, and to give uh, you some concrete example, we could use this for, for data traits, data quality questions, cybersecurity, HR. There are multiple ways to actually benefit from, from AI in internal, in internal efficiency. Um, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another one. Is this model put into ML ops? Uh, now I've reached my technical, uh, the limits of my technical knowledge. <laughs> um, is this model put into ML ops? And if yes, how was it done, Nils? Uh, this particular model is not. Uh, so we we did this. Uh, uh, this is a fictitious model, of course, for for this customer. But we do similar things. Uh, but it's not um, it's not productionalized. Let's say, uh, but it could be. Uh, as a service, for instance, um, uh, so not currently. Uh, but uh, to 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 allude to what I think the the, the question is is about on a deeper level, that we have uh, uh, we cooperate a lot with uh, AWS and Amazon. That's where we keep our uh, infrastructure. So if we were to put the model into MLOps, we would probably use that. And uh, in other parts of Volvo, we we also use uh, Azure. Great. Thank you. Uh, Helen, in your current role, you talked about using data to uh, fix uh, axles on trucks. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you identify root causes? Uh, we have a lot of log data on yeah, our vehicles. Um, I'm working more for the driveline on engine and transmissions and axles. And uh, there is a lot of this data and uh, we look into it and with our product knowledge and uh, yeah, experience uh, we try to see uh, what are the connections here we can find from data which at a glance doesn't say much and in that way we yeah, we provide this information I mean with this uh, storytelling to the project team where we have more experts into the hardware and so on and understanding the connections so it's, it's a, a teamwork here <clears throat> thank you Helen and um, I will take one last question, which is not exactly to do with um, with AI, but it's more to do with our electrification journey. It's a question for you, Jonas. Uh, how do we go about electri electrifying fleets in Australia, for instance, especially for long distance transport? Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I said that we are uh, to some extent uh, pioneering the, the the business years than we do. But uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of we are taking a gradual step, market by market and, and application by application. And where we are now, we are more more looking into uh, urban operations and operations close to the cities. Uh, we are. So, uh, we are sequently are, are gradually increasing the capacity of our vehicles as 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 the uh, the, the technology matures. So, uh, at this point, we are not in a state where we can handle the the toughest applications like road trains in Australia. But but I think there's a lot of interesting things that's coming on. We can see the batteries are maturing fastly, and then on top of that, we are also spending a lot of effort into to uh, fuel cell vehicles, which has electric truck as a base. And then we sort of add a fuel cell and, and hydrogen tanks as, as range extenders, if you like. And here we see a good opportunity for more long distance transports uh, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, hydrogen has higher uh, um, energy capacity currently and, and then, than batteries. So the, there, there are different alternatives, but uh, we it will take some time be, before we are have reached a point. 
Sure, but uh, I mean, for sure, the use of those very innovative technologies is is very exciting to to shape the societies we we will all live in uh, in a few years. Yes, yes. Uh, Thank you very much, Jonas, Niels, Robert, Helen, uh, for being with us today. Uh, thank you for your great questions uh, in the audience. Um, we are looking forward to your uh, applications to the AI challenge and uh, meet you again in a smaller committee in the VIP lounge in a couple of weeks. Don't hesitate to visit our career uh, website to see if some of our open positions could be a great match for you for your future development. Uh, and uh, of course, please uh, keep following Volvo Group on LinkedIn for future uh, live events. And um, for now, I wish you a great end of the day and uh, stay safe. Bye for now. Bye for now.